Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this week's Come Follow Me lesson with the Mormon News Report podcast. My name is Jenny Noonan Dye, and I am joining you from Provo, Utah, along with my husband, John Dye. He's the one who's responsible for all that you see on your screen for those of you who are participating via the live video stream. As always, for those who are participating in real time here on the video stream, we'd love to hear from you where you are, what stood out to you in your study this week, whether it's the first time or the 50th time you've read these verses, or even if you didn't read them at all. We get to as many comments as we can, just as we would if we were all gathered together in person. We like to try to use the space and time as a supplement to your other Come Follow Me studies to sometimes take a deeper dive into at least one aspect of the lesson that stands out. We love having your participation and your feedback. I'm going to go ahead and excuse my co-host for the Mormon News Report podcast, Brant Malone in Detroit. He is tending to some family responsibilities, some church responsibilities, and I think some dog sitting responsibilities. If I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct in you know interpreting his tweets, I guess. And welcome our good friend, our go-to for all the nitty gritty when it comes to our Come Follow Me study, our our actual expert in what he does. The very, the very best. It is Ben Bernard in California. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Jenny. Welcome everybody, one and all, to another Mormon News Report Hour of Power. This is a, a great chapter of our AP Church History Doctrine and Covenants, especially on this very sunny Father's Day. It is a glorious day, especially in California where we are. We have finally lifted the mask restrictions. We are finally getting our, our first time back in church with no restrictions, which means we get to hear the little ones singing, I'm so glad when daddy comes home, even though he really hasn't gone anywhere for 16 months, but still it's the thought that counts. Absolutely, thank you for that. I, I, I did wanna to say to you and to Brant and to John, happy Father's Day to everyone out there celebrating Cheer. or observing Father's Day today. Today is Sunday, June 20th, 2021. And, um, and our lesson today covers Doctrine and Covenants sections 64 through 66. It's called, The Lord Requireth the Heart and a Willing Mind. And uh, there's, there's quite a lot. The first section, 64, is, is quite lengthy. The other two are not as long. Um, I want to go ahead and say hello to Mary Hartman. Mary, in, watching in Syracuse, I believe Syracuse, Utah. Thank you for checking in. And again, for any who are joining us, uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and where you're from, and we'll get to the comments as we can. Ben, I'm really excited for this lesson. I know as we, you know, as a kind of a, are we a panel as, or as a, as a group, as we, you know, prepare, crew. yeah, <laughs> the crew, uh, as we prepare for the Mormon News Report and the Come Follow Me lessons, as we all talk together as a group, you had mentioned what you're gonna cover today. And I think that for a lot of people, upon hearing just the generalization of the topic, it can it can be a little cringe, a little sus, but but uh, I'm I'm excited uh, you know, learning more about as you and I have talked about where we're going with this. And hello to Leah from California. Tony's joining us from the UK. Good morning, Tony. Awesome. Yeah, so go ahead. So so question for Jen and for Mary and Leah and Tony and, and anybody else that's here. Have you ever had an experience in your life where you have held on to a grudge for so long that you actually forgot why you were originally mad? And maybe not you, but have you known anybody like that? Oh, yeah. Hmm. The first thing I think of, Ben, is Hatfields and McCoys, right? Huck Finn. Hatfields and McCoys. For, for the Tony Youngs from England, UK, who may not be familiar with the Hatfields and McCoys, who are they? What happened? Well, um, well, Huck Finn, I've forgotten the exact chapter, but you know that's, <laughs> that's something that is, is very well known to many of us in the US, especially if you've, if you've read the book. Anyway, the, there, there was an indiscretion between these two families as generations went on, though, they forgot exactly what had happened. It was lost in time, but the hatred continued. And um, it's kind of the Romeo and Juliet of, I guess you'd say, redneck America. Oh um, yep. 
So there's, uh, there, yeah, you just, oh, through time, you forget what indiscretions may have occurred, but you continue the hatred. Yeah, you continue the hatred. And Tony says, hey, he saw the film. Awesome. I think that was like the Kevin Costner one, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, th there, was, there was a movie about it where they were like, yeah, these are all the reasons we, we can show like the end result where people were just fighting and killing each other. But if you were trying to trace all the way back through history and figure out what started it, could you find you know the one thing? I mean, maybe it was a tiny thing. Jen, how about you? Do you have it? Have you ever had an experience where you've had a grudge, where you kind of forgot why you were mad, except all you knew is that you were still mad at a person? For sure, for sure. And I actually, I'm not as familiar with Hatfields and McCoys as much as the Montagues and Capulets, for sure. But, um, but yeah. And to be honest. I, as I think back on those times, there are times when I, I know that I feel the anger. I know that I feel, if not the hurt, then the memory of the hurt. Mm. And it gets to a point where it's like, it, it is actually, or close to comical, that I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, and, and when I've chosen to hold on to it, um, it's because of my pride. Um, and yeah. I, I, don't, I don't say that as like a trite, like, and I've learned my lesson because guess what? Mm -hmm. I've certainly I not, I have not learned my lesson. And, um, uh, but, but there are reasons and throughout, you know, life and experience, I, um, I've learned the, a lot of benefits of, of forgiving. So, um, mm -hmm. oh, but yeah, I'm holding on to grudges, it, sometimes it's, it's comfortable, right? We feel justified in the beginning in well, our, Oh, this is totally right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting you, you say that we hold on to grudges because it, doesn't it always get to a point where it actually takes energy to maintain the hold on it? Like it's something that you have to like really like you have to keep gripping like you're holding something heavy, right? Like if I had like a like my this little ring on my hand or whatever, if I were to, to hold this in the palm of my hand, eventually the muscles themselves would want to relax. Like I would want to let go that, you know, that, that, that clenching, that tension is supposed to be temporary. And so event, so it's like, I have to keep reminding myself, no, nope, keep holding on, keep holding on, keep holding on until, and this is where the spiritual symbolism kicks in until the blood flow starts to die off until the nerves start to die until I lose feeling until I start losing freedom and flexibility. And the next thing I know, yeah, I'm still holding on to it, but now I can't really hold on to anything else. Oh, and, it yeah. has, and it has been stuck like that. And now, and that's when we get to the point where trying to pry the, the fingers open actually becomes a painful experience to try to get to let go, right? So sometimes like it, it's almost just easier just to, just to hold on to that, even though I may have forgotten what I was originally holding on to. So that's, yeah, that's kind of a bit for you, Ben. Yes. Um, have you ever had uh, an experience where you were mad at someone for a long time and holding on to a grudge, and then upon you know uh, getting back into touch with them, you start to act as if everything's normal, and you and then you say, "Oh wait, I forgot. I'm mad at you." Oh yeah. Hang on a sec. Oh wait. Dang it. Yeah. And especially when you come back and you're talking with them, and they're and like maybe they've forgotten. Maybe they've moved on. Maybe they've forgiven you. And they are trying to repent and they're totally nice and they're totally cheerful and they're and they're everything's great. And then the little tiny memory comes in the back of your head like, hold up. No, 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 no. You were angry at this person once upon a time. Go back and, and act that way again. And you're like, ah, dang it. Yep. It, it totally happens. It happens. Forgiveness is a big, messy topic. And there are so many times when, unfortunately, we just get it wrong. Now, these sections in the Doctrine and Covenants give a tiny little glimpse of uh, a, a stupid little story. Well, we say it's a stupid little thing, but it was certainly big at the time. So here's kind of the historical background of what was happening. We had the saints that were starting to gather in Kirtland, right? So people are coming from New England and everybody's getting together in Kirtland, but they've also been told that they need to start getting ready to build the city of Zion. So they were anticipating this millennial reign, like God is gonna come down, Jesus is gonna be there, we're gonna have the city of New Jerusalem, let's get ready, so let's send some scouting parties out to Missouri. Now, just to be clear, Missouri and Ohio are not close by. I was looking on the maps the other day, uh, the distance from Kirtland, Ohio to far west Missouri where they wound up is around 800 miles. 
So for those in the Utah area, that's roughly the equivalent of walking from Salt Lake City, Utah, past Disneyland, down to San Diego. So if you've ever done that drive in a car, you know how long that would be. Now just imagine you're walking, you know, it, it's the absolute worst trek, it's the Pioneer cosplay, you got the buckets and the, you know, the, the scratchy cars or whatever. So not only did they have to go all the way down there, but then they'd have to go back. And sometimes they did that trip multiple times. So was the whole trip, and so was a lot of these elders, they were sent down there, was the trip kind of poorly executed and planned? Yeah. Could it have been planned and communicated better? Yes. Did tempers flare and did some people probably act like jerks? Probably because they were humans, right? And because of this, this kind of starts setting off some of the people against Joseph and Brigham and William and, 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 uh, and the Pratt brothers. And so many of them start, we start to see splinters. And in the middle of that is when we see God's command to forgive each other. As if it's just this easy thing that we can just do. I'll just forgive like it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and and it, I'm glad that you gave that historical context, Ben, because as I was reading too, I, I thought the same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's not a short trip. And you think about, mm -hmm. I mean, think about how, uh, how much preparation goes into a trip of, of modern travel of that distance. And, and in the midst of that, that's the, the direction that is given in a very, very busy time. And plus this was in the fall. And so you never know that time of year, how early it might snow and what they're going to run into weather-wise and all those conditions, they're getting ready. And the Lord says, um, hey, let's talk about getting along. I think mm -hmm. that is so significant. Can't you just please, just everybody just be kind to each other? Now, I mean, when, now for us nowadays, we're not going on trips like that as much anymore. And we're not going on those kind of voyages, but we are having our own share of problems in the church. A couple of examples that I'd like to share, all anonymized, but these are all story uh, true. Uh, there was a sister who was betrayed by her husband's infidelity. And as if that was not enough, because that alone is enough to be universe shattering. But then her bishop, when she was counseling with him, said to her, basically, let it go and move on. Story number two, there was a young man who was abused by a church leader, a position of trust. When opening up to his parents and other, uh, other youth leaders, they were all hesitant to press charges against the man because he had a high reputation in the community. And the question was semi-rhetorically asked, well, what would happen to him? Just imagine how devastated his family would be. Story number three, there was a young woman who was being bullied by the girls in her young women's class. And she didn't wanna to go to church. And some of the bullying was face-to-face, -face, very little of it. A lot of it was cyberbullying. You know, it was comments, it was stuff on social medias. And some of the leaders were like, oh, you just need to forgive them and just go anyway. Just be the better person. Just show up and just go. Story number four. There was a brother who, after watching the objectionable, or reading the objectionable posts on social media by other members of his priesthood quorum, including some of the priesthood leaders at church, bishops and counselors, is starting to feel like he doesn't want to go to elders quorum anymore. Story number five, last one. Uh, a young man saw some pornography and it of course instantly lodged in his brain and he stopped looking at it, but that image is still there and now he feels like he can't come back and take the sacrament because it's there and he doesn't feel clean. So how does he move on? So. Unfortunately, every one of these stories are true, and they all show different ways that we struggle to apply forgiveness in healthy, constructive, positive ways. Sometimes us as leaders, uh, sometimes we flat out teach it wrong. Sometimes what we expect from others and ourselves, sometimes what we expect from God is wrong. The whole idea of forgiveness is intended to help, and sometimes it winds up hurting 
even more. Like we're misusing a tool that like, you know, like a, a surgeon's scalpel that's supposed to be there to help heal us. And if we wield it clumsily, uh, we can wind up doing much more damage. So I hope that today we would like to clarify some things specifically about forgiveness, about what it is, what it isn't, and hopefully we can feel enabled with a more constructive and gospel-centered approach to how we can use it, either in our own lives or teaching others around it. Okay, does that sound good? Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, John, let's go to the next one, please. Let's start off with some very simple myth-busting. I'm Jenny, I'm really curious about uh, what you'd have to hear about this. Let's do a quick review for the class about what forgiveness isn't, all right? Now, if you've never experienced any of these, then awesome. I'm so happy for you. But unfortunately, each one of these does have a basis in uh, some degree of reality. First off, forgiveness is not a call to just forget. It's not a magic wand. There's no magical amnesia. It's not going to simply eliminate the memory of the violation that occurred. Because our brains are designed to remember. And it's because we remember that we have to forgive. So when we say you got to forgive a person, we're, it, we're not saying, well, just forget that. Well, let's pretend that it didn't happen. And that kind of ties into the second one is that forgiveness is not intended to be an escape of consequences. Now, here's a, another interesting story about this. When I was in college, I was in a car accident where a, a young woman uh, went speeding through, she was driving, for those of you who are familiar with Provo, she was driving northbound on University Avenue, going about 55 miles an hour, late for a baby shower, trying to find the address, and was barreling north on University Avenue. Me, in my podunk little car, was heading westbound, crossing University Avenue, when my light turned green and I drove through the intersection. And this lady and her big old Ford Explorer T-boned me right on the driver's side door, uh, going about almost almost 60. Um, it, it was a very bad accident. And I was, uh, I, I was hurt pretty bad. Several days later, uh, I was released from the ICU and thankfully we healed. But here's the point. I got a letter from her because I learned that she lived in the next block over from us at Married Student Housing at BYU. And she apologized profusely and was in absolute tears of having been so careless that one day that she just killed this guy. And she was, she just kept saying over and over again, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she was beating herself up. And I wish, I wanted more than anything else to find her, to go over and knock on her door after you know I was discharged and everything, and wrap my arms around her and give her a hug and say, "Sister, it's okay." I mean, I, I don't want to. I just, I don't want to say accidents happen because that's literally what happened. But I wanted to let her know that I personally forgave her. But I was advised by my injury attorneys not to have any communication, written or oral, to say I forgive you because from a legal perspective that could get her out of any legal consequences. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of tricky. When we say that forgiving, it's not intended to be an escape of the consequences. Likewise, if you know, we talked to all those stories at the top about people that have gone through abuse or, or violation of some kind, sometimes they'll say, well, just forgive me as a way of weaseling out of the consequences. You know, People would say, well, if you really forgave me, you stop bringing this up. So we, we got to cut that one off right now. Forgiveness is not a get out of jail free card. And this ties into the third one as well, that forgiveness is not an excuse to ignore what happened. We're not making reasons as to why or what, or saying that what they did was okay. We're not justifying the mistake because in doing so, if we ignore what had happened, it will likely not only enable further bad behavior, but even worse, in my opinion, it discounts the pain of the abused. So, yes, it is perfectly okay to press charges against a person who has broken the law. That is literally the point of the law. Does that mean even if they're a family member or a leader of the church or they have a good reputation? You know, objectively, we should say it doesn't matter, right? That, that consequences should always be there. And of course, it's not up to me or anybody else here to determine how that applies for our, our, our gentle listeners. 
But I guess the, the, the key point here is it is okay to be cautious about how we trust people going forward. And it is okay to follow up on the consequences of when those things have, have taken place. Uh, the next thing that forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not a magical relationship fix. We can't just say that if I forgive a person, all of a sudden things are going to go back to normal. It's not going to magically make things perfect. You know, a wise person once said that trust in a relationship is like a balloon where it takes a hundred breaths to blow it up, but it only takes a single pin to pop it. And you can't undo the pinprick. You can't undo the pop. Once it's broken, it's broken. The only thing you can do going forward is decide whether blowing up another balloon is worth it and whether you will find a way to protect yourself against future pinpricks. So when we forgive people, we say it's not a magical relationship fix. Forgiving somebody, it's not going to unpop the balloon. It's not going to automatically restore the trust. It's not going to cancel out the act of betrayal. And to go on to the next one, forgiveness is not an act of feeling. And here's what I mean by this. I think if you look at a lot of our human behavior, you realize that most of our actions, if not all of them, have a root in emotions. Like we feel something first and then we do. I feel hungry, so I shove that whole thing of Froyo in my mouth. I feel tired, so I sleep. I feel happy, so I hug my wife, right? We have all these emotions that we do and that is the genesis for our actions. Sometimes we can think that Forgiveness has to be an act of feeling. Like I have to feel like I'm ready to forgive this person. I have to feel happy towards them. I have to feel like I'm kind. Or once I feel like the pain has gone, or I feel like I'm, I'm charitable or I'm kind, once I feel that way, then I'm going to act forgiving. But it turns out that if we say that I won't forgive a person until the pain goes away, or I, I'm, I'll forgive them as soon as I feel better about it, we might wind up waiting a long time before that feeling comes around. Also, in the last two, and then Tony, I'd love to get to your comments and your questions here. Um, forgiveness is not a one-time decision. And, and um, it's kind of like pulling out a splinter where it feels so good where you pull it out just the once and then you're good. It's natural to be just like one and done, you know, have a simple fix everything gets back to where it was. We can blow up another balloon, we're totally good. But it usually doesn't happen that way because yeah, I can decide today that I want to forgive a person and then for some reason I can wake up tomorrow and all those feelings of anger and resentment and jealousy and betrayal can just come right back over and over again. And the stupid thing about emotions is that sometimes they will come back completely unbidden. Like we have no control over when they decide to surface. If something decides to bubble up into my brain and it's like, yep, yeah, that's at the forefront of my brain. So, oh, this is what we're feeling today. Okay, that's what it is. Which means then that this forgiveness is not a single solitary event, but it's a longer process than that. It's something we have to choose repeatedly. And finally, forgiveness is not a time machine to an innocent past. It is so nice to think that once we forgive or once we are forgiven, that everything will be better again. You know, we can just go back. We, we crossed the wrong bridge. So let me backtrack across that bridge. And I'm on the other side of the room and I can take a, a different path. But the truth is, is that once you forgive a person or if you're trying to forgive a person, the pain and the hurt will still be there. You know, to quote uh, young Frodo Baggins at the end of Lord of the Rings, some wounds are so deep that they will never truly heal. We simply have to learn how to live with the pain. Now, this is not the expectation that we just have to forget everything or, or you know, say we're always gonna be permanently miserable, but we have to have a realistic expectation that forgiving a person does not mean we go back. It's intended to help us find a new way forward. So before I go any further, uh, Jenny, any thoughts or comments on, on these things we've talked about so far? I like what you've shared. I like what you've put together, Ben. I think that those are all very applicable and, and good to remember because especially if we find ourselves in a, in an interchange or I'm sorry, an exchange of whether being the giver or the receiver, 
of advice when it comes to forgiveness. Just forgive and forget. Um, those are different things. And um, and also, I, I like that you said that one thing forgiveness is not is a time machine to an innocent past. I think to me that is the same or similar to it kind of goes hand in hand with an excuse to ignore or a magic mm -hmm. relationship fix, because essentially it's, you've got this new information and this new experience and what are you choosing to do with it moving forward? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really great point. So with that, actually that ties into let's, let's pivot now and talk about what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. Um, because we've kind of explored, you know, from the negative side, let's take a look at the positive side. And of course, this list is not intended to be exhaustive, but I think this should be a, a good starting point to help us remember the best parts of forgiveness. First off, forgiveness is a chance to carry the memory and the lesson, but not the pain. So we can remember how we got injured. We can remember how we were betrayed. We can remember what somebody did wrong or we can remember what we did wrong even as the pain gradually fades and i think that one ties into the second one is that forgiveness is a commitment to let the wounds heal and here's what i mean by that one of the the fascinating things about our human dna is that we are naturally self-healing creatures when everything is working as the way that it should uh, Self-healing means that, you know, even if it's very slowly, even though it takes years and sometimes decades, our tissues will regenerate. Now, to, to a certain degree, I have a scar on my hand right here. When I was a teenager uh, going around through the, uh, the horse fields of Alpine, Utah, I slipped and fell and reached out to grab myself on, on a barbed wire fence that was outside uh, one of the pastures by our house. And I cut, I caught the wrong part of the fence. And as a result, sliced my hand open. And now that scar is with me 30 years later, right? It's, I still look at it, it doesn't hurt anymore, but you can be dang sure that any time I go walking past a barbed wire fence or any type of fence and I have to reach out and grab something, I am a little extra particular about what I grab and make sure that I'm not, I'm grabbing the smooth grabby part, not the pokey don't grab me part right and because that wound is there that wound used to be there it took time to heal but it did now for us our emotional wounds sometimes they can get sliced open and they can cut to the quick just as deeply but the wounds that we feel eventually can close down now this does mean that the negative parts that come from the wound the resentment the revenge the regret the removal from that uh, community with, with that other person, those can all be useful things as emotional shields at the beginning. Those can protect us when the feelings are raw and when we are struggling to overcome the wound. But like all emotional or like all physical scabs and scars, the emotional scabbing that we feel is intended to be temporary. So if you've ever had a scab on your arm from a, a little cut or a scrape, how do you make that scab last a long time? Well, like my mom said, you just keep picking at it and you keep reopening it. You keep re-injuring yourself and it's never going to heal. So how do you get rid of it if you want to? You have to let it heal. You have to give it space. You have to give it time. Sometimes you can give it a little extra nourishment and closure by, you know, the Neosporin and an awesome Star Wars Band-Aid. But eventually you have to have that commitment to let it heal in its own time. So the next one that goes with this is that forgiveness is a chance to set the new boundaries. And this is part of the empowering aspects of humanity that I'm still trying to understand, that we get to decide what our boundaries are. You know, I, I read recently a very wise person said, boundaries between people are designed to be a border between wisdom and folly, not between you versus me. So when we set boundaries in a healthy way, what we are saying to ourselves is here inside, this is my safe place. This is wise. But on the other side of that boundary is foolishness. So this is not like a good guys versus bad guys. This is not you versus me or whatever. And I don't need the other person's approval to set my boundaries because healthy boundaries 
that I establish for myself need no justification, need no explanation, need no announcement of their arrival or a or their departure. And at their best, they can be framed as an invitation to people that you are interested in having crossed those boundaries. Instead of saying, I'm not going to associate with you because of this, we can say, hey, I am I would be happy to invite you to cross onto my side of the boundary according to whatever these rules are. Um, the next thing with this, when we say that forgiveness is a chance to set new boundaries, it is also an intention to leave the judgment or the punishment or the ill will or the vengeance to others. Now, that other could be God, that other could be law enforcement, that other could be your mom who's going to call that person up and chew them out, you know, whatever the case may be. But the whole idea is, is that whether that negative consequence of that person's choice <clears throat> is going to be swallowed up in mercy or meted out by justice, in theory, it should make no difference to us because we can hit a point where what happens to that person is no longer our concern. We can free ourselves of having to carry the emotional burden of the punishment and the negative consequence. Because what I do get to choose then is what happens to me. And I can say, this is, this is what I'm gonna take care of is on my side. So whether that person gets judged or they get punished, or even if they don't, if I, at first I will leave it in the hands of the law. And after that, I will leave it in the hands of God. And because of that, you know, we said what forgiveness isn't, we said that it's not an act of emotion. What it turns out to be then is an act of willpower. It's an act of will. It is an intentional action that we need to choose regardless of how we feel. And that's one of the hardest parts. We don't forgive people because we feel like it. We forgive people because it's the right thing to do. Because we understand the tremendous consequences that it carries, both good or bad. And this means that we will especially need to learn how to forgive others and forgive ourselves if we don't feel like it. And in fact, it's probably at those times when we feel the least inclined to forgive a person when it's needed the most. And because of that, it's not a single one-time thing. It is a repeated decision. It is an ongoing attitude. It's something that we have to remind ourselves of repeatedly. So when those emotions come unbidding, when they come all the way up there, we're like, oh yeah, that's the thing that I have to do. And finally, it's not a time machine to an, to an innocent past, but I like to think of it as a blueprint for an improved, not perfect, but improved future. And, you know, the funny thing about blueprints is that once you have the blueprint, that doesn't mean that the building is done, right? That doesn't mean that everything's finished. It just outlines what the future is going to look like. And so now the, the building and the hard work, but all that part, that's now on us. So we have the blueprint in front of us, and now we have something to go for. All right. Jenny, what do you think? What are your thoughts here? I love it. I, I really like, you know, going back to something that you said at the beginning, the idea of forgiveness is that it's it's intended to be something to help ourselves and and it really is a personal choice i love these these um examples of of what forgiveness is that it is it is a repeated decision for sure like you said before one thing it isn't is a one and done often we find ourselves having to forgive repeatedly but like you said it is an intention um, I really like, like your idea of it being a blueprint for an improved future, because a blueprint is something that is very helpful to have like a map. And, um, and when we think about, you know, like, like you had said that, that we forgive because it's the right thing to do. I believe that it's the right thing to do because of how it helps us when we are able to free ourselves of the worry for justice, which let's be honest, sometimes we have to accept that the justice maybe won't won't be served. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's a that 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 the benefit why it's the right thing to do is because we are freeing ourselves 
from that worry, from that anxiety, from that judgment. And, um, you know, there's a saying that I hear quite a lot that um, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. And, and that to me is why forgiveness, forgiving is the right thing to do. Because if we don't, if we don't let it go, and again, not the, not the memory or the lessons to be learned from it, but when we are able to let it go, we are freed of that poisoning essentially of ourselves and we're able to create something new for ourselves and for our future. Yeah, absolutely. Could, could we take a look at some of the comments from the class um, here? Yeah. Because I think some of these people have brought some things up that are absolutely wonderful. I would love to start with Tony's, um, uh, Tony's comment. So what is the forgiveness of the debt that was spoken of by the Savior in the parable of the one pence? And then he says, again, 100 pence. Tony, that is a fabulous question because that parable Oh, there is so much that we lose in the English translation without the without the context behind this. So quick summary of the parable. A, a young man is brought before a Lord and the young man owes the Lord uh, a debt. I want to say it was like, a, um, we'll just say a hundred pence. Okay? Now a pence was the measure of money that an average worker would earn in one day. So therefore, 100 pence, that's 100 days worth of work. That's like three months worth of salary, okay? Um, oh, sorry, hang on a second. I just realized I'm, I'm, I'm getting it wrong. He is, this young man is, he was brought before the, the, the Lord with a debt of 10,000 pence. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Hebrew, when they use big numbers like thousands and ten thousands, it was not intended to be accurate. It was intended to be intentional hyperbole to show you an astronomically huge number that could not be measured. Like this, this is such a big, so the point is not that, oh, you owed me $10,000. The point is you owed me so much money, you could never pay it back in your lifetime. Like there is just no way. And in that story, the Lord who would have been fully justified in wiping that guy out or throwing him in prison for the rest of his life, forgave him. So that debt was absolutely as astronomical. Then the man turns around and one of his coworkers or another person he knows winds up ending him money. And it was not a small amount. I think that's like, it was like a hundred pence, right? So about three months worth of work. So it was not a small amount. It was significant, but he did not forgive the guy his three months. And then the Lord finds out and he's like, wait a minute. I forgave you this gigantic, gigantic amount. And you wouldn't even turn around and forgive him that 100 pence. Okay, so the story and the application that I see in this is a gentle but firm reminder of how astronomical my sins are on God's ledger books and how freely and willingly he is to wipe them clean, even though I may not never be able to pay it back and I could never get there. <clears throat> and if he's willing to do that for me, could I then turn around and look at my brother who called me that name on the family Facebook chat and it's stuck with me for all these years and I'm kind of holding it against him. Could I not let that go? I like it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's when we are, when something has been done, which presents us with an opportunity to forgive, it can be very easy to see ourselves as from the point of, uh, well, as when we see ourselves from only the point as someone who has the opportunity to forgive, we often don't include the other aspects of ourselves, which, you know, are, are also in need of forgiveness. Yep. Um, is it okay to move it to the, the next one? Okay, so Sandra says, I have forgiven my ex-husband, but like you said, sometimes the feeling pops up. It is such a hard thing to do, but I have noticed when those feelings come up, they don't last as long and I can go back to my normal self quicker. Sandra, I, I good for you. I, I really think, you know, as Ben pointed out and included in the slide that, that forgiving is something that is, is an intentional choice. It's, sometimes made often 
and benefit from that. Forgiving, I would even say, um, could be considered a skill that when we practice it, it can become something that we are better at doing moving forward. And you being in that situation, um, that is not easy. And so as those feelings pop up or another situation pops up, which requires or from which I, I'll say instead of requires, um, a situation from which you would benefit by extending forgiveness in whatever way that means to you, not as defined by someone else, um, the better off you will be. I, I love the comment about what Maria said. Um, she says, I will forgive, but I will not forget or trust that person again. And then Tony brings up the great question, isn't forgiving actually allowing trust again? Hmm. What do you think, Jen? So I would say that, I mean, I don't know the situation that Marie is referring to. I think Tony brings up a, an excellent point. And, and I would say that that is, is a personal decision because if we are to say, forgive and trust again, again, those are two different things like forgive and forget. And perhaps part of of setting boundaries as part of forgiving someone else or part of having your new blueprint, depending on the person, depending on the action or the situation, maybe not having trust for that person again is, is the right thing moving forward. Maybe that is where safety is to be found. That doesn't mean that, you know, you can't um, interact with that person again. But for certain things, it might be like, oh, well, I, I, I'm not going to trust them with whether it's information or resources or whatever the thing is. Um, that might be a boundary that is healthy, that needs to be set and is appropriate as part of, of forgiveness. Because otherwise, I, I would say if we're forced to, to trust again or yeah, forced or encouraged to trust again without without that coming from ourselves, that may um, that may be how do I say inconsistent with the feelings of what what forgiveness actually is. I mean, I and I would say just again because Tony does bring up that is a great point. Maybe the maybe the result down the line will be okay. I've gone after this you know, this experience, I'm, I've forgiven the person and I didn't trust them for X number of, you know, insert measure of time. Um, and now I found that I can trust again, mm -hmm. but that doesn't need to be immediate. It might be, a, it might be a result again, long-term or for further down the line, but it, but if it's something that helps you in the forgiveness process and in, um, in setting your boundaries to be healthy, to be safe, then, then that's what it is. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm really grateful for everybody in their comments in the discussion about this because I think we're coming to understand that forgiveness and trust are absolutely related, but they are distinct, right? For forgiveness is dealing with the debt that has to be paid and trust has to deal with my choices on how to interact with that person in the future. So a person could pay off the debt and that, so they no longer owe anything but I am not necessarily under any obligation to trust that person that they're not going to incur more debt going forward. Right? Yes. When, when, I, when I, when I hang out with like uh, my friend's cat, the first time that I, I pet the cat, he's laying on his belly and he's like, okay, I totally want you to come pet me. So you pet the cat, you pet the cat on the belly, you pet the cat on the belly. And if you've ever touched a cat on the belly, you know that after that third pet, they will go into murder death mode and they will just <clears throat> and like totally attack you. And then you get totally mad. You're like, what the heck? And then I learned from that, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I, I'm not gonna be mad at you for doing that. I now know how I have to interact with you. I'm gonna pet you a different way. And it's not that I don't trust you, but it's kind of that I don't trust you. And because I know that if I interact with you a certain way, your chances are you're, you're going to hurt me again. And in yeah. a very oversimplified uh, model of human interaction, I think that's very similar. It's like what Mary says over here in the comments, it's forgiving with boundaries. 
that you know the one part is taking out it's taking out the debt but then we get to set new boundaries going forward so mm -hmm. trusting a person does not mean that we go right back into the same patterns of behavior and we go right down that same path that led us into the pain the first time around if yes. so that sounds more like folly rather than wisdom right. so the white approach is to say no wait a minute that path hurt me and i'm going to choose a different path and when a person might say, well, wait a minute, don't you trust me? I can say, well, I trust myself to choose a slightly better path this time. And because I've learned from it, I'm now going to go along and I'm going to find a way that's not going to cause any potential potential pain. Exactly. Um, trusting or even forgiving does not mean that you then put yourself in a situation that you've been in before where you know you've been hurt or betrayed anything like that. Like Rachel shares, sometimes it's trusting the other person and sometimes it's trusting yourself and your decisions. Yeah. You know, there's one of the verses here in Doctrine and Covenants I'd like to take a look at. <clears throat> John, if you would pull that one up, please. Uh, this is in DNC 64 verses 9 and 11, 9 through 11. And this is actually kind of interesting because it helps explain the theology or the, uh, the spiritual implications of forgiveness. Uh, and there's kind of a, a different perspective in our version of Christianity. You mind reading that for me, Jen? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm happy to. Wherefore, I say unto you that ye ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you it is required to forgive all men. And ye ought to say in your hearts, let God judge between me and thee and reward thee according to thy deeds. Mm. So here's the question, I guess, then for the class. Why does me not forgiving another person mean that I now have the greater sin? How does that work? Like if they do something wrong and I don't forgive them for it, now all of a sudden I'm the bad guy? <laughs> To me, if I'm being honest, first, first I need to say that I, to me, DNC 6410 is one of those verses that for most of my life, since I was a teenager, to be honest, has been of such great comfort to me because, um, because it, it's, it's a release. It's a, it's a pass. It's, I will forgive whom I will forgive. It's a, you don't have to worry about this. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. As for why, um, it like it says in verse nine, he that forgiveth not his brother, his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord for there remaineth in him the greater sin. To me, that's almost a, how do I say? It's a type or a version of, um, of taking the Lord's name in vain and hear me out. <laughs> no, but, that's good. Go but it's essentially because like, you know, the, the parable that you shared earlier about the man who was forgiven such a great debt, but would not forgive someone else uh, a, a less sizable debt. To me, that is, and again, this is not doctrine or anything. This is, this is my own personal <laughs> my own personal opinion that that to me that is in that is a way of of taking the the lord's name in vain because because if we don't forgive it's a bigger offense because we have no right to do that we are not jesus christ we are not perfect we are not the savior of the world and we don't have that right uh and and let's be honest there are a lot of times i don't want to dismiss time you know any sort of intentional things where forgiveness is a is a key component but there are times when forgiveness might be required for something that is unintentional and mm -hmm. and so perhaps especially in those cases um it would be such a far greater offense to hold on to those grudges Absolutely. You know, I, I like what you said about taking the Lord's name in vain. In a sense, by us refusing to forgive a person when we have an opportunity to do so, because it's not, I, I, I want to be careful on how we use these verses, because this can be one of the verses that can be 
I've seen it weaponized sure. and used wrong. Yes. Where they say, look, you're supposed to forgive people. And if you don't, then you're the biggest sinner. So let's talk about how big of a sinner you are because you haven't forgiven that person yet. And I'm like, yo, hold up, hang on. We were talking about this other person here for a second. Let's let's address that. So that is, like you say, it's a skill. And that's something that we have to take time to learn how to develop. But when we have that opportunity and that invitation to forgive and we refuse to do so, that's almost like us attempting to take over the judgment in God's place. Like we say, oh, we know better than him. Like I'm going to deny the atonement on behalf of that person. And even though Christ has already paid for it, I'm going to say, no, 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 I'm not forgetting. No, that's not the way it works. And so that's the, that's kind of the stupid thing about grudges is that when we hold on to these grudges and when we don't forgive, that really means that we are making an active choice to hold on to that grudge, right? Because pain will fade unless we get reminded of it. And so every time that we remind ourselves of that pain intentionally, every time we were forgive we refuse to forgive and we refuse to just to move on. That's almost as if we are re wounding ourselves. We are pulling open that scab and that draws us further away from God's light. And so I see this, like, like you said, how it's a gift. I almost see God saying, he's like, guys, I, I, I need to warn you about this, that if you don't forgive each other, you're going to wind up hurting yourself more than they originally hurt you. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's just gonna make it worse. And I like how he says down in verse 11, you ought to say in your hearts, let God judge between me and thee. As in, as in he, as if he is saying, that would be the best thing for you to say. So when you get to that point, because I know it's going to take time, let's get to that point. And that's what you should be saying in your hearts is let him forgive. Do everything you can to build a new future, learn your lessons and move on, but let's leave judgment to him because that is why he has that antidote, right? That's why he's there. I I saw somebody say recently, John, if you go to the next one, please, that how all these concepts are related over time. And I summed it up with these, these three simple little things. The past is bound by forgiveness. The present is mended by reconciliation and the future is charted by trust. Now, I I like the, I I intentionally chose the word bound in the past. Bound as in the same sense of like setting boundaries, what, right? But also in the same sense as like a prisoner is bound and tied up. So when we say that the past is bound by forgiveness, meaning that that past will be held prisoner and un- won't become the past until forgiveness is granted. That sets the boundaries. Once you have forgiven that person, we set, okay, it's, we say, that's the past. I'm ready to move on. And that present can now be mended by our reconciliation. And reconcile literally means you take two and you're coming back together again, right? So this means there needs to be apologies on one side, forgiveness on the other, and those get mended. And just like every bit of mending, Mending means there will be small needle incisions. There will be stitches on both sides. There will be something that will kind of hurt a little bit, but there will be something that will hold you together, whether that's you and the other person or whether that's you and your future self, or most importantly, hopefully that's you and God. Those two sides can be mended and stitched together. And yeah, there might be a little bit of a scar. There might be a memory of the past, but that's part of the tapestry that we are weaving. It was never intended to be flawless. It was intended to be mended And that is the the new story. And that story then is what we see in the future because that future will then be built on trust. That's the blueprint. It recognizes the risk. It recognizes safeguards we have to put in place. It recognizes the boundaries. But when we are charted in that trust, it does not give permission to be hurt again. It does not give a free pass to somebody to say, go ahead and hurt me. And it realizes that pain might return but it's still willing to proceed through that storm anyway. So yes, you can make a new plan. You can make new relationships going forward and you can feel free of whatever bitterness, whatever punitive feelings that may have been holding us back. But now we can go forward to a more healthy future. I like it. Any thoughts, any comments on this, Jen, before we wrap it up here? I really, I really like, uh, I think that's summed up well. And I'm glad that you addressed the, the word 
choice of bound, but I, I think you did very well in explaining that. Thank you. So some final thoughts here um, as we kind of close this off. One of the absolute uh, wonderful guys that I, I love hearing the story from, um, C.S. Lewis said, there was someone that I love, even though, even though I don't approve of what he does. There was someone I accept, though some of his thoughts and actions revolt me. There was someone I forgive, though he hurts the people that I love the most. And that person is me. You know, we often wish for a perfect world. We often wish for perfect relationships. We often wish for things that are free of pain and drama. And in doing so, if we were to have that perfect world and those perfect relationships, we would miss out on the opportunity to grow that unfortunately only comes through struggle, right? And because we miss out on that growth, that means that we would be incomplete. And the old Hebrew word for incomplete is imperfect. Because that's all that perfect means. It just means complete. It doesn't mean flawless. So therefore, it's this very pain and the struggle that we are trying to avoid that paradoxically can make us whole eventually. And since that pain of relationships is inevitable, it is absolutely critical that we learn how to process it properly, how to handle it gingerly, and to absorb and learn from it constructively. Pain is not something to be avoided. It's something to be assimilated and built upon. So this means that, yeah, I haven't quite learned 100% how to love myself, even though I don't accept everything. I haven't learned how to love without approving a person or how to accept a person without some degree of revulsion or how to forgive a person in spite of pain. But I'm trying, and that's the lesson of our lifetime, right? And I'm... Sadly, I'm sure that I give the people around me enough study material on how to forgive and opportunities to practice forgiveness on my behalf as well. But so it goes with all of us, right? Just like with the early saints struggling to follow prophet back to Missouri, so too it will be with us week after week, learning how to forgive our fellow men and women who are the least of these, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And in doing so, hopefully we will learn this final simple truth that to forgive a person is to set a prisoner free and then to discover that the prisoner was you that's excellent and i um i really appreciate those words and especially going back to as you were talking the examples that you gave at the beginning of, of actual real, real stories and you, you spoke of one young man who, who was having trouble forgiving himself. Um, I, I think as difficult as forgiveness can be, a lot of times we find it easier to forgive others than we do to forgive ourselves. And for some people that's, that's the case more than anything else. And, and I think we would be well to realize that um, that 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 scripture dnc 6410 um applies to forgiving ourselves as well of us it is required to forgive forgive ourselves that doesn't mean that we um don't need that we ourselves are free of the consequences uh but part of that transaction is also forgiveness for ourselves so, amen so thank you very much ben this i mean what a valuable lesson um i think very very timely very helpful um very applicable and um and throughout life and a lot of things um i want to thank everyone who who participated in this lesson today we had uh, quite a lot of people join our class today and we are grateful for you being here whether or not you uh you typed a comment to let us know that you're here we're, we're happy that you're here and we hope that it was something that was edifying and uplifting to you as a supplement to your other Come Follow Me studies. Um, once again, I want to say to everyone out there, um, I hope you have a fantastic, is that what it says? Mm -hmm. Father's Day. <laughs> awesome. Um, our, if you heard that knock at our door what, during the lesson, that was someone dropping that off for them. So, so happy Father's Day to those, again, who are celebrating and observing that. Next week, we will we will be here again 
at around 9 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time and all the other time zones that correlate with that. It will be on Sunday, June 27th, 2021. And the lesson is called Worth the Riches of the Whole Earth, and it will cover Doctrine and Covenants sections 67 through 70. Once again, thank you all so much for being here, and we hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, feel free to reach out with any other commentary, questions. We always love to hear from you, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.